If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This has been another episode sponsored by Online Horse College. If you haven't had a look at the wide variety of equine-specific accredited courses, then go to onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Today on Horse Chats, we've got someone pretty exciting. We're going to talk to an architect about equine facility design. But before we do that, I just want to remind you that Sophie Barrington from Archer Creative is available. So if you're frustrated with a low return on investment from your marketing efforts, talk to Sophie at Archer Creative about copywriting, public relations, social media, email marketing, graphic design, website design, everything for your horse business, they're the equine marketing specialists. Go to horsechats.com, search for Sophie, search for Barrington or search for Archer Creative and you'll find her and you'll also find some of her podcasts where she's been giving free advice to us. Meanwhile, we come back to our very special equine architect, Leonie. Leonie Lee has ridden and trained horses most of her life. She's also a qualified architect. She's lectured in design and wrote the first equine facilities design course in Australia. How are you, Leonie? I'm very excited to talk to you today. Oh, I'm very well, thank you. And, and thanks for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity of uh, increasing uh, awareness on what horse facilities can be. Mm, mm. Look, great, um, we all talk about you know, we might get a new property and it may have facilities on, may not have facilities, but no one is doing it specialist as an equine architect. So I'm um, very excited to talk to you and hopefully the information you give us will help people with our own facilities just design them a bit better and just consider a few more things with the design. That's a great opportunity. Thanks mm, for that. Mm. Um, I guess as a, uh, a principal designer in our that specialises in equine facility. Uh, look at everything from the stables to the exercise arenas to the property planning, but also what's really important is all the little bits and pieces in between um, and, and how that can help with daily management, with safety, uh, with horse mental state. Uh, and so it's this whole big life experience we hope to celebrate and, um, and our approach, we try and accommodate the behaviour and the physical needs of the horses from very much an evolutionary perspective. And I guess that's what sets apart yep. um, from other construction firms. Okay. Now, Leonie, we normally start off with a favourite quote. What have you got for us? Well, I thought something that is very relevant to me uh, is life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. <laughs> um, I think it's quite astute as well. But um, it's got great truth to how my days unfold. Uh, I try and plan to nth degree. But um, no matter what you're doing or you get caught up doing it, you get distracted and events get laid on. But I think in hindsight, we sometimes value those distractions or those redirections as um, very valuable experiences. So that's my life in a nutshell and what I live by. Yeah. Now, Leonie, I'm going to ask you about your life with horses, but I'd like you to think about more, when did you put two and two together? Was it always that you were interested in architecture and interested in facility design, which is quite a big thing for a little kid, but, you know, along those lines, or was it one decision where you thought, ah, oh, right, I could do this? Oh, that's a great question. And I think um, it's something that I... Uh, because I've evolved naturally and, and my ideas came together, that I, I forget that it's probably something quite peculiar for people to, to combine. Um, I think there's only a handful of us worldwide um, that specialise in, in combining those worlds of architecture and horses. Um, and I guess where it stems from my very early childhood. I had a passion for horses from, I don't know, seven, eight years old, from spending days on my grandfather's cattle farm in northern Victoria. And uh, there was, I was always very artistic and, and loved being creative, but never really honed towards a career in architecture. But um, what I did relish was just being with the, the horses, uh, watching them move, um, groom them, look at their bodies, study the biology uh, diagrams in my picture horse books. And all of that um, 
was something that I continued on into my young adult life um, and going into adult riding club and, and a couple of horses trying to, to work through eventing. And uh, as I entered into my architecture degree uh, at Deakin University, I continued on with that. And when we came to final year thesis, we could pick a, a research project. And I was very involved in riding for disabled uh, as a qualified horse handler there. And I thought it would be a great opportunity to combine my two love interests there and then. And so I spent a whole year uh, developing the idea of a, an equestrian centre for all, so for people with disabilities and uh, for horses and for the able-bodied. And so it, it started from there. So from the, the day I, I finished architecture, it just rolled over into an interest that I continued to research I think I was a bit of a frustrated vet, really, and so I, I got into my <laughs> veterinary journals and tried to apply it wherever I could find an application to stable design. Um, everything from respiratory disease to ulcers and um, psychosis and just looking at the connections constantly. So mm-hmm. it, was quite, it was a very natural evolution, but, um, yeah, it, I guess it, it's something that's become quite niche and, and uh, an ongoing interest well, What did your lecturers say at uni when you said, this is what I'm going to do? Were they, I mean, because there wouldn't be many people that would come along with the pro. No. Did they say it was unique? No. It was, and it was really interesting. I actually had to educate them a lot on what a horse could be mm. and what a building needed to be. And, and I would admit um, to now, in hindsight, I very much was blinded by my traditions and what I knew horse management to be then, and it was something that it wasn't through um, no fault of, of my family or who I was connecting with, but it was at certain points when I, um, for instance, I, I remember reading um, Stephen Bedansky's The Nature of Horses, um, and, and that really turned my ideas on their head about what a horse is and stop anthropomorphizing yes. what a horse is. And um, from my architectural experience at uni, um, that's what people tended to see them as, um, either dogs or humans and, and how you contain them. But the bonus of, of being educated as an architect is that you're a problem solver. And mm-hmm. so you look at the first principles of what is the problem. Okay, so I'm accommodating an animal. It's this heavy. It's this shape. It does this kind of movement. It might be prone to these certain um, behaviours. And so you look at accommodating a an environment, a built environment around that that distinct problem, um, rather than going through a catalogue and looking at what's what's available and what colours and what materials. So it, it's a really interesting thing that um, my architect supervisors uh, could nurture um, just through that problem solving experience of, of general design, which was great. But um, yes, no, I remember my um, thesis supervisor. I gave him a book on horses at the end. And um, he said it was the first, <laughs> it was the first and only book on horses he'd ever received as a as a gift of being a supervisor. So <laughs> I do I do um, relish. And also he the next year I became a lecturer as an assistant lecturer under his guidance. So it was that's where I became um, my starting in uh, university as an educator, <laughs> which was great and led to Marcus Oldham. So it was good, yep. good opportunity. Tell us something that you might have done in your final research mm-hmm. project that you might look at now and say, oh, I don't think that's the right way to keep horses. Ah, very much. Um, it would be isolated containers. Yep. Um, I saw uh, stabling, as most traditional people do, as separating the animals for their own safety, for mm-hmm. our convenience, for the durability of their rugs, whatever the issue is, to monitor their feeding. Uh, and I didn't look at the consequences of what that does. Like complete separation, walls to the top? Yeah, in terms yep. of, yep. well, yes. Um, there might have been openings, I think there's openings to the, the central aisle. Okay. Um, and there were definitely openings to the external. But in terms of physical contact, there was mm. nothing, there was no room for aloe grooming or shared um, muzzling or, or all those sensory needs that I really feel are important to horses. Um, and when you have intensive stabling, um, all that is removed. And so there was that issue that is is one of my main um, drivers today. Yep. And although I know group housing isn't for everybody, um, there there are different ways that we can accommodate um, th- that that need for interaction that the horse has mm-hmm. for its mm-hmm. um, herd mates and, and, and the world, the world yep. greater, the greater world and the horizon. Um, so, yeah, definitely that was yep. the yep. 
that was a part that I would I would develop further now. And to the point that even if I do a little stable complex um, for a small um, private herd of, of um, loving leisure horses, um, I still try and create a space where they can come together and and rest and 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 eat, um, or be separated out and, and eating um, close by. But where they can where they can actually move. Uh, and be horses in amongst the herd um, uh, if, if if they choose to be yeah. um, in, a, in a wind protected and, and some protected element. So it, it's one of those things that is the, the drive for yeah. my designs yeah. now. So for someone who is an architect or is, you know, at uni and thinking about architect, what would you say to them? Or I suppose you might even employ them, you know, but, but what would you say to them mm. if they wanted to combine the two? How would you encourage them? I mean, what's made you more than an architect that does horse stuff? You know, you've talked about the veterinary journals, but, but what else do you think you need? Looking at the veterinary journals, I suppose that's that open-mindedness. Yeah, it is. And, and being an insatiable learner. So mm-hmm. finding people with a common passion that you can learn from. And so it might be turning to others, old horse hands or um, people that teach everything from riding instruction to how uh, jumping courses are put together. So looking at the, the, the small detail and then and out to the bigger picture and then back to the, the micro detail, you, you're in and out constantly um, and, con- and always looking to problem solve. So be a lateral thinker um, and not blindly accepting tradition. So yep. open to new ideas, but... But still understanding what's gone before. Precedent is really important, um, and particularly in, in what not to do. But just there's a lot of really great aspects to um, horse design of, of 100 years ago that has kind of been left. And um, although in, in many instances a lot of that was suited to storing wheelbarrows and, and hay, not rather than horses, <laughs> there's, there's still some really good aspects. So it just being very much searching um, for that little part that really intrigues and interests you. For me, it's behaviour and horse behaviour mm-hmm. um, and how you can apply that in stables. So that trying to find something that you can relate and will keep you going, you know, when it's two o'clock in the morning and you've got a deadline <laughs> in four hours' time. Yes, <laughs> yes. And it can, yeah, propel you through. with it Because there, there are times when it, it you can be um, a little controversial or, you know, you you feel like you're, you're zigging when everyone else or the opposite, but it, it's something you're, you're true to your own passion um, mm-hmm. and but able to look for others to nourish and maintain your commitment. I think yep. you, you can yep. get there for sure. So what's the best thing about taking the path down to be an equine designer? What's the best thing about it? I think, um, I don't know if your listeners are familiar with that story about the, the starfish story um, where there was a, a man walking, he was walking along this beach and he saw a young boy, I think, picking up um, something and, and throwing it back into the water. And he came close and he realised he was picking up starfish. And um, the boy said, I'm throwing these up because they'll die through lack of oxygen. And the man mm. said, you can't save them all. There's thousands on this beach. It's happening all along the coast. You possibly can't make a difference. And then I think the boy, we looked up and he frowned. And then he picked up another starfish and he smiled as he threw it back in the sea. And he said, I made a huge difference to that one. Yes, yes. And I think making a huge difference to that one propels me to do the next project, to do the next talk, to do the next webinar, whatever it is, the next article I write in Horses and People magazine. It, it's mm-hmm. just one of those things that, because um, many years ago, I on my grandfather's farm actually, I witnessed all these horses. They were um, coming off a, a big transport truck and uh, they needed to rest somewhere on the way to the sale yard, which yep. is essentially code for going to the abattoir. Yep. Um, and my grandfather opened up his farm for them and they were all running down the race and through lanes and everything um, kind of for their last night. And most of them were still plaited up uh, with the promise of a new life, but which was never yep. going to happen. Yep. And for me, I just thought if I – one day, and this was me about seven, eight, year nine, if I could make one of these horses, although I wanted to save them all, um, if I could make one of them reach their potential or to be at their optimum well-being, you know, in my own seven-year-old speak, that that would have been mm-hmm. then, that would mean the world to me. And I guess that's where, what drives me now. Um, and although I can't save all the starfish and all the horses, um, if I can just tell somebody, look, if you really 
think about putting that dark material there on the on the north side of a building, you realise the heat that transfers to that horse overloads them even on a winter sunny day. Yep. Because their thermoregulatory system is very different to us, and and what they can tolerate is much uh, cold weather much easier than warm weather. Mm-hmm. If I can make difference that awareness that yes. it, it, to that it, one horse is standing people, in that one oh, shelter. Yep. Exactly, exactly. And if it makes somebody's development just be a little bit more aware um, or that that horse, because a lot of respiratory disease um, monitored, and but uh, many horses don't undergo scoping because there's no outward signs. Mm-hmm. You know, there's stats in journals saying, you know, 14 days in an intensive stabling environment for, for yearlings, thoroughbred yearlings, there's, there's signs there of respiratory distress. And so I think... Um, we just need to be aware of that and be able to say, okay, well, how do I change that? Maybe it's not about having this horse pristine, clean and ready for the, the event tomorrow, but um, looking at how you can create an opportunity for that horse to have real mental contentment, which is very tricky, very tricky mm, to measure. Mm. And um, But, yeah, I think if we, we try and just accommodate that evolution, yep. we're, we're going a long way. So, yeah, that's my motivation. Yeah, yeah. You've talked about your grandfather, and obviously he had an influence from the horse side of things. Yes. Your was it your lecturer, your your supervisor? Who was that? What yes, was yes, his name? Definitely. Yes. Or, yeah. Um, so his name was um, Mr. Nick Beatty, and so he was the head of school of architecture at Deakin University at the mm-hmm. time. A very considerate and encouraging man, and uh, we used to enjoy our chats about horses. And he would just be open to discussing whatever research I could. Uh, place week to week on his desk and yep. and and look at really trying to support me and and I guess maybe he saw a career in it as well mm-hmm. um, and that was many years ago now but um, from then I the opportunity to work at Marcus Oldham College um, and write that course was an an amazing chance um, to really have people listen to how things can be done. Yep. Um, but and that was um, something that I am very, I feel very privileged to be able to speak to these students every year mm-hmm. and um, continue that. What about horses? Have you had a particular horse that's influenced your career? I mean, I'm thinking of those horses running down the laneways and, you know, they that group of horses, even though it was just one night, it's influenced your career. Oh, definitely. But have yes. there been any others that you'd like to say? I've probably had uh, uh, about 10 horses over my life, Mm -hmm. Um, everything from off-the-track thoroughbreds that I crazily entered into to um, Irish crosses. And um, my, my, one of my most, I guess, proudest moments with my own horses is about 10 years ago, I decided to take on a bit of a project and I bought a Clyde Cross yearling and it was to sell him on as a truly solid riding prospect. I wanted to have control over his whole education. And I was very much um, Andrew McLean driven, Monty Roberts, um, and, and looking at that whole preparation before um, he was saddled. And it, it went beautifully. And though I was months doing long reining around the farm, looking at different letter boxes, and it was just <laughs> um, before I, I actually sat on him for the first time, I, I laid on his back and desensitized him for months and it just went beautifully and I guess that is something that I'm very proud of and he went to a local hunt club and became um, a lead in that hunt club and um, months later the new owner had complimented me on how good the job I had done and you know it was a really you know, I was a good horse trainer when I told her it was my first horse I'd, I'd actually had um, the privilege of breaking in um, she was May so yeah that was very much um, a wonderful proud moment but there's yeah, also my yeah. own son, his therapeutic riding. Yep. Um, my child, he's seven now, but back when he was three, he um, Henry's autistic and he was partaking in hippotherapy, which is hippos being the Greek word for horse, so therapeutic riding with his OT. And um, he, when he was about five, he rode independently for the first time, which was very special because normally he'd be lying on sheepskins or sitting backwards yep. or whatever he needed to do for his therapy. But, um, yeah, so he had natural seat and stick, and but the joy on his face was very heartwarming at that, that moment. Um, he had no fear, but that's another issue we're, <laughs> we're working with. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. so good, lots it? of little horse instances that kind of be like, okay, so that's how they're – and, for instance, we're doing a, an arena at the moment, and 
equestrian centre and there's the prospect of doing RDA in this arena. And so I'm bringing, okay, my experience with my son, but also my RDA horse handler of 20 years ago, that experience in. So it's constantly drawing on that first hand of sequence of activities you do to get from here to there and who interacts and, and how they create little design nodes. And, and so it's kind of this really interesting matrix in your head uh, of all your experiences with horses coming in to each wall you place and, and what the shape of that roof is and, and, and where and where the sun's um, shadows are. It's, it's really kind of in, intriguing that way. So yep. you live it and you breathe it. Yes. <laughs> and you dream yes. it. Yep. Very much. Yep. Yep. Thinking about yourself now in equine facility design, what's been your proudest moment there? I think it was one of my first projects. Um, so I was a lot younger, a lot more um, less experienced and not long out of university and I landed the 70 horse development of the Friedman Brothers oh, raising, yep. um, <laughs> yeah, raising um, royalty in uh, Rye and th- that was an amazing opportunity um, and it just came by chance we were doing another project and we were fitting out um, a, a human based project um, it was a, 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 an office with some furniture and we are ordering some furniture from a uh, in Melbourne and this person who ran that company was friends with the Freedmans and they were asking what else we did and, and um, it came about simply by a by, uh, little introduction and um, a couple of weeks later, I was meeting the brothers and we were talking about uh, this 70 horse courtyard arrangement of building and um, and that was that was very uh, instrumental in my direction mm-hmm. and uh, and the Friedman brothers, to their credit, um, were very much in favour of an external based environment and and they felt that the horses thrived in an area where horses could see one another but also be open to the elements and. And back then, their their idea was we were easy to put another rug on a horse, and or another jumper on a um, on a worker, yep. and have the the horses cooped up in low roofs and, and barn style. That's good, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Arrangement. Yeah. I'm just thinking back, you know, because I studied for a while at Crabbit Park in the UK, and it, it had their main stable was a courtyard based, and and I know that a few others, you know, the, in the UK of courtyard based and. Yeah, I think the idea was to bring the horses into the courtyard so they'd all be contained and mm. saddle them up or get them get them ready. Oh yeah, but um, yeah, you know, it's almost like coming coming again, isn't it? Rather than the barn style is, going for the yeah. courtyard. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think uh, particularly given in Australia where we do have, well, depending on what state you're in, but we do have some temperate climates mm-hmm. um, or, or warmer climates. It, they do offer that opportunity. To have the horses externally based, still covered, and I think that's really important. Um, even with the the cover, which I kind of tend to think of it as a canopy of a tree, um, is to make sure that there's shade options. That's to me is more important because sometimes you cannot keep out driving rain, particularly if you're in a coastal environment. But if you can keep the horses from overheating. Mm. Um, it's really important. And in a, a courtyard environment, um, obviously that means that you're going to have long extended roof eaves and, and quite often people uh, position lots and lots of columns and posts to support that. And I think uh, in courtyard design, one of the biggest um, attributes of that experience would be to try and eradicate all those posts because they, one, they they become issues with you leading a couple of horses down or if you're passing or if a horse shies and, and so there, there's um, problems with them all around and so with the Freedmans we turned the trusses upside down and supported the roofs without needing the columns and, and it just opened it all up. The one thing I would say about courtyard design though which is something that I um, am challenged by is that horses still need to rest and so and there's um, a lot of studies saying that early afternoon is a good time for horses to rest and so you need to be able to remove them from physical activity and watching things all the time that humans might be engaged with if it's cleaning or, or whatever. Um, but, yeah, so it's looking at ways of doing that too and where the horses go out to pasture at that time or or whatever or the, the stable management is part of the solution there. So, yeah, but it, it, I think courtyards, there's, there's a lot of scope for combination courtyard barn environments, I think, too, so where courtyards are back-to-back 
Okay, so you've got yes. the best of both worlds. Yep. Yeah, and then you can look at seasonal change. And, and some horses do not settle in barn environments, but they settle in um, courtyards. And I know with Maccabi Diva, she wouldn't settle in a courtyard environment when we were uh, um, down at the Freedmans. And so mm-hmm. there were several long yards at the back of the courtyard, which although were very large and spacious and, again, a big canopy roof, what they looked out on was far less um, active, and so that's where she settled. And so it, it really depends on the horse, and I guess designing a house for a person. You know, if, if somebody's into their their movie theatres and their gyms, you know, versus somebody who's into their libraries and, I don't know, or, or needs a rumbus room, it's just it's in that adaptability and that flexibility is, mm-hmm. is, I think, the key rather than one, one design fits all out of a catalogue. I think that's where your consultation with the owners would come in, wouldn't it, you know, beforehand? Yes. To see exactly what the requirements are. Yeah, and we call it a bit of a wish list. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've got this, uh, I've developed this uh, five-star mode of design where um, everything centralises around the horses, but you've got the people and their wish list and, and what their budgets are and their um, aesthetic preferences for how it looks. Um, and then you've got construction and materials and that comes into their ideas as well. And it kind of all just simulates and um, and it, it's almost like um, it, it goes through this machine and this everlasting gobstopper pops out at the end and that's the design that you, you synthesise. It's interesting that you've gone to a five star and you're going back to the starfish story. Oh, that's really interesting. No, I've never, yeah. Oh, that's a really – I've never made that connect, connection. Both of those are in my head. So, yeah, interesting. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. <laughs> I'll work with that and develop yeah. that idea. <laughs> yes, yeah. Leonie, ulcers. What are you doing to minimise ulcers? Okay, so uh, a couple of things um, in terms of the, the scientific research and journals is, one, obviously the foraging. So the horses, how they're evolved to, to forage for – so many hours of the day, um, head down, so that whole um, position, uh, which helps with drainage of mucus and and dust, um, as well as digestion, um, can help. But also having, I like to create an environment where they have unlimited access to foliage, so your haze, um, and create that, that, so that's number one. Um, And I definitely do not... um, support high hay racks or, or anything above chest height for animals um, that have evolved to, to graze on the ground, um, as well as they can be an issue with getting hooves stuck. And I've, I've seen a horse hanging from one of those before, which wasn't very nice. Um, yeah, so um, so you've got that. So that's one side of it. And the other side is, I think, is to try and minimise the stress that the animal is under. Um, and again, this becomes tricky because at, we obviously can't chat to them about it, but looking for signs. Um in other evidence-based scientific studies where heart rates of horses um, are reduced when they are groomed by one another, when they see other horses, when they see externally what a noise is behind them rather than a chainsaw or a tractor happening in a, in a place that they can't make visual contact and, and comprehend. And, and we all know that that horse, um, that adrenaline surge and, and, and when the horse realises that it's not in danger, it can bring that down quite quickly. And, and if we can try to minimise the chances of that happening and how that connects biologically with the horse's gut um, and, and the stabling environment is very important. And just and constant access to the horses, I think, is, mm-hmm. is very, very important. And, and, and simple things like um, the horse's vision it's very different to ours and, and how it adapts to light. Um, and, and so putting them in, in dark places from light to dark, so if we're coming from the outside to a, a space that isn't very daylight-filled um, and maybe relies on artificial lighting, um, it can be quite stressful for an animal. Um, and some, some horses bitch weight or desensitize quite quickly, but still there's that, that constant sensory um, challenge for them. So if we can have spaces that are, have even daylight, um, it, it, simple things like that can really help with simple things like ulcers um, and just by creating an, in, an environment that um, is, is minimises stress. Um, although, you know, it's something that I need to delve into and do some evidence-based studies and research myself, and this is my future direction, um, but in terms of all the indicators would say that that would 
be um, advisable okay. um, from yep. every aspect of the built environment. Yep, yep. Thinking about just to going out and looking at people's property, houses, that you know, just just generally, and they might be just private owners, they might be other public places. What's some of the common faults that you see with their facilities? Um, I yeah, I think one of them is uh, very low ceilings. Um, for the the size of this animal, and whether you're talking about it, you know, even a pony, mm-hmm. um, to these large warm bloods, uh, that quite often things are built to a minimum, um, and you know, minimum height clearance. So when the horse maybe puts its head up high, it doesn't hit it, but it simply reduces the the air change capacity and and what's available up there for fresh air and possibly even how the the natural passive ventilation works through the building. Um, so yeah, that would be definitely a common fault: two lower ceilings and two smaller spaces. Mm-hmm. Um, and another one is uh, not thinking about the how horse behave um, with one another and what they need. Okay. Um, so okay. isolating them. Yeah, that would be yeah, the, yeah. the big thing that yeah. needs needs addressing for sure. Sure. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. Okay. Now, Leonie, have you written a book? No, not as yet. It's in it's in the making. Because I'm thinking, where where can people get ideas then? You know, to get ideas yeah. about equine yep. facilities, equine design. What, how can they do that? Have you got something you could recommend? Definitely. Well, I've, well, I've just completed. Yeah, I've completed a ten part series in Horses and People magazine. Mm-hmm. So over the last couple of years, um, every couple of months, um, there've been great supports of my ideas. And so that's from, it starts at the history of horses and the whole idea of uh, history of horses and stables, sorry, um, and how we culture and status has formed um, our domesticated looking buildings. And now they're a little bit more agriculturally based buildings. And, and so it talks about all that, the consequences of, of what we do and how we accommodate behaviour. So that's a starting point, and they're available online if people don't have the, the physical magazines. Okay. We'll put the link to them in your page too at Horse Chat. So it'll be horsechats.com yes, yes, yes. slash Leonie right. Lee, and we'll put those details there. Wonderful. Yep. That's great. And I also, um, I'm a little bit slack on the social media side, but I've just about, um, I've launched my own page, Leonie Lee, and in brackets called the Equitech. Okay. So, essentially equine architect and equitecture horse facility design is another Facebook page. And I'm also going to Equitana. I've been selected um, for the second year in a row to be an educator there, and um, which is wonderful. And uh, surrounding that whole horse festival, I've decided I'm going to offer some free uh, workshops on stable design. So if people are interested in that, um, they'll be in the Geelong and Melbourne areas. Uh, they can contact me uh, and on the Facebook or my email, and and um, we can go from there. If anybody's oh, sounds, I'm sure I'm sure that more. people will be. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, now just in a few sentences, if you've got to summarise your philosophy with keeping horses and designing places for horses to live, what would you say? I guess uh, number one would be equine centric. Mm-hmm. So where the horse is, is the centre of every decision that's made. Um, and it's steeped in equine science in terms of, of where that's coming from and the high art of architecture. So it's not just about drafting or, um, or constructing a building, but actually looking at all the different context issues as well as having first-hand horse experience, I think. So all of those coming together is, is our approach mm-hmm. and directs the philosophy of the business um, or the practice. And I guess the days are behind us when performance in the ring or the track was your overriding focus. Um, and what went on in the stable was largely insignificant. So I think now having an understanding of horse welfare, and the, there seems to be a growing um, movement of that whole idea of, of natural progression, um, I think lends itself to contemporary horse facility design beautifully. Mm-hmm. And um, that's hopefully something that I can be a part of Beautiful. in the future. So how can people contact you then? 
So my um, email is leone at equitecture.com.au. Now, Equitecture is E-Q-U-I-T-E-C-T-U-R-E. Um, and again, like I mentioned, the Facebook. So I'm Leone Lee and in brackets, the Equitech and Equitecture Horse Facility Design. Um, so I've got lots of different um, ways there as well as if you want to come and meet me at Equitana. I'm there on Thursday in Melbourne. Um, but yeah, you're welcome to, to contact me on the Facebook if anyone's interested in different stories. I think that's what architecture is about. You mentioned this earlier about a, a consultative process with the client. Mm. I learned so much from horsey people. Um, and I love going to Marcus Oldham and hearing their stories, you know, particularly if they're international students. And, and you know, I had one student and her issue was dealing with tigers. <laughs> <And I'm> like, <laughs> okay. Yes. It's a bit different. <laughs> That's a little bit yeah. different to, you know, we have snakes. But, yeah, um, yeah. and so I, I, I welcome people's stories and ideas and it's, it's very much a dialogue. Um, and, and every time I start a design, it's, it's from start, it's from everybody else's experiences that I've learned from. Um, that, that directs it. And so, yep, yeah, please get in contact me if you've got stories or questions and um, we'd love to be uh, involved in, in, in chatting about it further. And those details will be on horsechats.com slash Leonie Lee or just go to horsechats.com, search for Leonie or search for Lee, L-double-E, and you'll find that. Leonie, thank you. I think you're, you're our first architect that's come on the show to talk about facility design. So we'd love to have you back again. And I'm sure that we've got a, oh, a wealth you. of information to give us. That would be oh, really that's good. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. Thank so you thank so you. much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank that's you so okay. much. Bonus. Talk to you soon. Bye. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 